everyone, welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan, and today on Wandering DMs we're going to be talking about dice. Do you like one die? Do you like polyhedral dice? Do you like crazy dice? Do you like a whole bunch of dice? Maybe you don't like dice at all. Let's talk about that today on Wandering DMs. Hey yo, bada bing, bada boom. Talking about dice, dice man. <laughs> right? No? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, now we are. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you've done? <laughs> uh, dice is really uh, fascinating to talk about. There's so many directions we can take this. Um, yeah. And I think that dice have become um, really like an, a, a huge part of the hobby, right? We all collect them. We all have probably way too many of them. Uh, they're a big industry now, right? Like yeah. there's whole companies yeah. that do nothing but make dice. There's artisans yeah. making custom dice and running yeah. you know crowdfunding campaigns for their new dice that are making millions of dollars it's it's wild i i agree with that i am really surprised when i get on social media these days and see what just a a dizzying or you know rainbow array of uh <clears throat> different dice manufacturing that people are coming yeah. up with and competing with is like just like i never would have guessed that uh 20 years ago that that would be a that would be such a such yeah. a cottage industry yeah, we've come we've come a long way from the little yeah. uh, little soft plastic marbles and and crayons that you have to use right. to color them in yourself, and maybe one person in your group's actually got a set. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. But we're also going to talk about yeah, mechanics, me... right? We're going to talk about dice mechanics and how do you use dice and yeah. Uh, yeah. how different systems use dice. You know, let me give you let me let me just give you know, and you know, once upon a time, I thought that I was a person that had a lot of dice, and now I'm like, oh, geez, I, I like, I, I actually have a fairly small amount of dice compared to some role playing aficionados. But let me just start off with yeah. a love letter to dice, right? Because obviously, it's not the only randomization mechanic in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, before D and D, you might be using cards. Um, uh, for in, in for in statistics, at one point people would would publish big books of random number tables, yep. and you'd flip to a ra you'd flip to some page, and you'd point to some location on the page, and that would be your random number list uh, for that for that day. I seem um, to recall there was a, a habit uh, in the old wargaming play by mail days where folks would just have a common book, maybe a phone book of a certain area or other book, and they would just say turn to page thirty seven. Mm -hmm. You know, or yep. they would uh, they would agree to look at the last couple digits on that day that day's stock exchange report yep. or some yep. or stock that they picked out yep. right as a way to, of uh, having random numbers that they they didn't know in advance yep. was common. There were um, uh, what were called teetotems at one point, which were which were actually like tops that you'd spin with numbers around the edge that what whatever it fell on would be a random number. And as someone that got the basic D and D set in a, the particular dark ages uh, of the late 70s, uh, they, it didn't come with dice originally. So I was one of the people that actually did use the paper chits yep. in cups to randomize for quite some time until uh, my mother, bless her soul, uh, actually came in with dice one day. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I have actual dice. And, it, and the wonderful thing about dice is that it's among the fastest ways of getting a random number. Like anything else, yep. you got to shuffle cards, you got to toss a toss a, a cup of chips or something like that. But dice are like about the fastest way that you can get a random number. It's pretty immediate, and it's also human verifiable because, of course, nowadays we could use a computer pseudo random number generator or something like that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we're always in the situation of like, do I really trust it? Right. I can't. No, we cannot look <laughs> underneath the foot really and confirm that any particular result was actually fair. And so, you know, a lot like balloting, frankly, there's a big advantage to having a physical cop, physical mechanism that any pretty much any human being can verify is uh, is fair. And the dice are both fast and verifiable. So they're a beautiful, they're a beautiful mechanic for randomizing numbers and to this day i don't know anything that's really better at the hmm. at the table hmm. interesting interesting you know i it's funny you mentioned the chits because i as a as a kid of course had the mold vey set which came with your little bag of of plastic dice and your crayon to color in the color in the numbers but i was also a little kid which meant i wasn't very good at taking care of my stuff and uh things went missing and so i certainly remember uh, playing games of D&D &D where I would take a plastic cup and a piece of paper and write numbers and crumple them up and chuck them in the cup and shake it up and toss out a, toss out a number that way. 
uh, as the, the cheap uh, replacement for uh, can't find my D12, I guess. I guess I'll use that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. The, dice. Um, so I will also mention, you mentioned owning a lot of dice. So here's here's a ridiculous thing that I have here. Yeah. Uh, as as some that. folks know, uh, I run or used to run pre-COVID a uh, uh, annual gathering of friends, a small sort of mini con. And I got in the habit of bringing this sucker, uh, which is a lovely chest of dice. Uh, this, nice. was always, this was always a fixture at that event. Dude. Uh, that was Super bought nice. at um, was bought at a convention. Uh, I remember you could go to Gen Con or such, and there were various booths with, that would have just vats of dice, and you could buy them by the pitcher full. And you would get a big plastic pitcher and you could <laughs> scoop them up. That's where that came from. That is fantastic. I always kind of wanted to do that just to feel to feel a pitcher of dice. Frankly, I didn't. It's I, did, I didn't feel like I had a need for it, but it was like really attractive. It's a lot of dice. It's a lot of dice, and it's totally unnecessary. And I didn't need it at all. And I bought it just just for that, just for that. Like I want to, I want to do the picture. I want to yeah. get in there. Yeah. Um, but it's nice. It's it's kind of nice for a gathering like that. We have like twenty to thirty people show up, and that thing is just a fixture in the kitchen. So if anybody at any point ever needs dice, like there's a shit ton of dice. Just go get them. right. right. <clears throat> Now, Paul, you know, and, and our viewers, um, of course, we're talking we're talking dice, of course, today. Yeah. And um, I don't know if some, if, but uh, you know, some of you may have heard that um, not all dice uh, have six sides like this. Um, <laughs> some have some have different numbers of sides. Shocking! That, Shocking! And, and I okay, I see that in the chat already over there um, that some people are already talking about that that interesting novelty of dice of different sides. Um, and of course, uh, we know. Oh, geez, you have a picture. That's there convenient. you go. Fantastic. There you go. So There's some dice. We know that. Yeah. <laughs> so we know that um, we know that dice have been used basically as long as recorded history. As a matter of fact, you can mm -hmm. go into Egyptian tombs and see dice that were manufactured uh, three thousand years ago or something like that, um, and up through uh, you know the war gaming era, the twentieth century, up into the sixties. It was still most certainly most common for people to have d sixes and maybe you know several several six sided dice. And the thing was is as you go through the sixties and people were interested in, in having more detail in their war games, um, they started to have mechanics that were multiple dice, two dice, three 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 dice with a combat results table. And there came a point where people started to use. Uh, real-world military science results for mm. gun accuracy and things like that and targeting. Um, and those military science results always came to us in terms of percentages. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if, you know, for, the, for the people such as um, uh, Croms, I think, if I recall correctly, started to do this, started to just present actual military science tables as percentages and then would have an appendix of, well, now what do you have to do with your six-sided dice in order to recreate 20% or something like that mm -hmm. and had increasingly complicated, well, roll three dice, and if the sum is either a two or a 10 or an eight, then that's going to be 25% or something like that. <laughs> and so there was kind of a real hunger to uh, represent those percentages more efficiently. And that's actually where the what we call D20s come from. The original right. use was to have these things uh, generating digits for percentages, and that's actually where non-six-sided dice really exploded. Yes. Now they, they did look like these guys here, right? They looked right. more like they look right. yeah more like this. <clears throat> Correct. Correct. Yes. So you have uh, you have one uh, the the black guy there obviously has faces zero through nine twice, yep. and if you roll that twice, then you'll have you'll be generating percentages. Uh, and for some of us of particular age, that's what twenty-sided dice look like. And I'm always I'm always interested when younger players find one of those and go, "What in God's name was this for?" Yeah. Well, it was you know it was uh, before the ten-sided die was invented. But for some of us, more important, it's kind of a more obvious thing to use because it is one of the geometric platonic solids of which there are only five in existence, um, and uh, that's what was available. Uh, from an outside company right. when when D&D &D was written. 
And there was a lot of methods for getting a number from 1 to 20 out of that. Some folks would color or, or mark half of the faces mm -hmm. to know that you had to add 10 to those halves. Uh, yeah. A lot of folks would roll a d6 alongside, so mm -hmm. if the d6 came up 4, 5, or 6, you would add 10. Yep. 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 <clears throat> And a lot of it's interesting because a lot of the you know a lot of the war game percentage tables for convenience were rounded off to five percent increments. So it starts you start to very quickly go in a direction of well why not have the mechanic just be based on a d20 instead of actual percentile dice in the first place? And you jump forward a couple steps and more or less you have the D and D d20 mechanic that we all know and love at this point. Um, now interestingly, you were talking about. Um, earlier that so so you know this all comes from a wargaming history right war games wanted to generate random numbers um and that prior to having the d20 basically all you had was the d6 um now is are these older war games still only rolling a single d6 because i'm i'm used to an era of playing like warhammer fantasy where you had fistfuls of d6s where you were rolling many many d6s is that has that yeah, not always been true <laughs> I don't think so. My understanding is that, you know, a lot of war games up through the 60s and 70s were table-based. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I'm familiar with things from Avalon Hill where nowadays they call it the D66 mechanic, where you roll two D6s, you don't add them, you read them as digits. So right. you either get 11 or 12 or uh, 16 or 21 would be the next one. Right. So my, my understanding is they tended not to be individual results. I'm not, I'm not the most experienced war gamer, honestly. Okay. Uh, but my understanding was, uh, like, most stuff from Avalon Hill up through about 1968 was still just using 1D6, hmm. just 1D6 on some kind of table, and things started to get a little bit more elaborate after that point. Certainly by the time I was had my Moldvay kit, right, which came with your um, little bag of plastic, uh, you know, polyhedral dice and your crayon to color them in. It came with a single D6. Right. But in that time period, of course, I had a closet full of games like uh, Monopoly or Life or Risk or other games that would have a bunch of D6s. So regularly, my collection of, of dice in that box would then be augmented by several D6s that I had stolen from other sources. Because you need them for character generation, right? You need your three d six to to make your ability scores, right? Or four d six if you're playing first edition. True, true. Mm -hmm. So I agree. I did the same thing. I was I was stealing a whole bunch of d sixes from from other games, and yeah. you know, so in the in the era when I was using chits, right? I could have, I actually did have d sixes, and I had a couple of those, but everything else had to be. Yeah. Had to be on paper for me for about a year. Certainly, you'll see a fair number of like really hardcore old school folks who will look at this pairing of a D6 and a D20 as the classic set, right? This is the bare minimum of dice you need because you can generate 1 to 10, 1 to 6, 1 yeah. to 20. Um, maybe yeah. you're using old, old original edition D&D &D where you didn't have variable damage by um, weapon type, at which point who needs a D4 or a D8 um, mm -hmm. you know, or a D12? They're just not used. I agree with that, and I'm, frankly, that's a very attractive game to me. Um, we've seen some DMs, like we've seen Bill Webb, right, mm -hmm. come to a game with one giant D20 and one giant D6 and run a whole four or five hour evening game for 20 people yep. with just yep. those two dice. And frankly, that's to, to me, who's a bit of a, a minimalist, that's, that's a very attractive game. And, you know, when, when, as DM, and I, if, for someone who thinks that pacing is really important, I kind of don't want to scramble around for a whole bunch of different dice in a big pile that I can't tell. Like that, the more the more different types of dice I have to deal with, the more that's going to slow me down a bit. And if I just have a big pile of D20s and D6s, I feel pretty confident that I almost don't have to look at it. I can just go bam and get the result uh, resolved uh, more quickly. The fewer kinds of dice I have, so. As DM behind the screen, I actually don't mind. I mostly have a big batch of D20s and D6s. If the players have mechanics that they use other types of mechanics, solids, that's great. But I personally, there are days when I really do wish the game was just D20s and D6s. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, we, I, had I question, you, yeah. we had a question go by a while back in the chat, um, and it's going to be way up there at this point. Of, uh, you know, granted that when D&D &D was published, 
they were recommending that you buy sets of polyhedral dice from another com company, and they would come in a full set of five of the four-sided, six-sided, eight, 12, and 20. Um, to what extent were the D&D rules written, pardon me, <clears throat> to what extent were the D&D rules written to promote sales of uses of the other dice? And so there's some question, even in the original Little Brown books, were the other dice really necessary? Uh, they, they worked them into numbers appearing for monsters and not a whole heck of a lot else. And so one question is when the first supplement changed all the damage numbers to all kinds of different dice, um, as, uh, uh, can you read that for me, Paul? Yeah, so uh, Dan Ebert uh, in the chat here has posted, do you think the rumors are true that the Greyhawk supplement with variable weapon damage was a push to sell more polyhedrals? LBBs seem like they only really need D20s and D6s. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I mean, I don't know. Um, it is a good question, but it does seem like the D20, D6 is your core your core mechanic and everything else does seem a little extraneous around that. Yeah. Like you didn't yeah. really need it. It's interesting, but... My understanding of the history was that these dice were originally being produced uh, for uh, educational purposes, math, probability, etc., etc., and that generally they were sold as this set, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that they got co-opted by gaming, and so gamers wanted the D20 because they wanted to be able to do stuff that was basically percentage-based, and then when they purchased it, they ended up with also a D4 and a D8 and a D12, and that, uh, what's a gamer going to do when presented with these unusual objects? Obviously, they're going to find a use for them. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Now, you know, uh, and, and another thing someone's pointed out is our, our, uh, uh, our colleague, John Peterson, of course, does really incredible RPG historical stuff. And he has a video specifically on early dice on YouTube. You should definitely go... Uh, look that up because if you haven't seen it because it's really wonderful and one of the things he shows that I think is really interesting is a clear container that packages together three 20 sided dice that again only have digits on them and uh, I think he describes that as for uh, statistical testing purposes uh, if you just take the whole container shake it up throw it down and you have one two three digits for three decimal places of precision for your random mm. sampling at one point interesting which uh, is really clever and nice. It's a little bit smaller dice, but it's all one package. You just do this, and you have uh, you have uh, three digits of precision in your random number. And I can totally see at one point that would have been a lot more efficient than the alternative: get a big thousand-page book and flip through that. Yeah. Uh, which was the other way of producing numbers at that. Point. Now, interestingly, eventually we get our uh, our D10s. Right? They come along. I don't know at what point they they show up, but. Um, that gives you your, your full-on precision, right? Your full single-digit precision of 1 to 100. Um, right. And I certainly remember when I was a kid growing up that this is probably, you know, the major differentiator between uh, RPG rules at that time. You had your D&D, your &D, which was still using D20s, and I had a lot of games that were switching to percentile roll under, mm -hmm. right? You yeah. had games, I think Palladium does that, GURPS did that, uh, Warhammer did that, right? A, There's a lot, a lot I mean, see... I feel like that, that, that's kind of the obvious thing, right? So if you use military science tables that are produced in percentages or any kind of real world data in percentages, of, there's a 15% chance that this is going to happen. Kind of the obvious thing to do is generate percentiles and have a roll under mechanic. Mm -hmm. uh, they use that in, you know, TSR used that in the Boot Hill game, uh, published the same year as D&D, &D, as a matter of fact. So they were they had games in the same year as D and D that were using the same mechanic for particularly gunfire. If you have again, if you have tables for, mm -hmm. for gunfire from real world research, that's kind of the obvious thing to do. Yeah, I mean certainly D and D started using the percentile dice. Right, the the big thing I remember, of course, is using them for treasure tables in the back of the DMG. Right, you're yeah. certainly going to roll plenty of percentiles. Any of the big tables, right? They start getting you know lots of <coughs> lots and lots of percentile mm -hmm. dice. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know historically when these came along. I mean, you'll, you know, I'm sure, you know, Dan. That the big thing, right, is that they're not platonic solids, right? There. Correct. They, correct. They, they and don't quite still fit. hold a grudge against that. I mean, like, <laughs> as soon as you brought those out, I was like, well, all right, if you want to be, you know, a little heretical, okay, um, uh, I'll forgive. I'll forgive you. Uh, the, those those came out in the the late '70s. If you look in the first edition uh, DM's guide. Uh, Gygax mentions them as a possibility, 
Uh, they're, they're actually in an illustration there. Um, the text doesn't actually say to use them for percentiles. And the die that has the, you know, the decades, the tens on it, that hadn't been produced yet at that point, to right, my knowledge. Right. Um, now, I will say this. Okay, so a lot of, a lot of old schoolers, right, remember and love the 20-sided dice, the, icos the icosahedrons that have zero to nine twice, and you'd have two different colored dice of those, and, you know, PSR games would use those in Boot Hill or Top Secret or Star Frontiers or things like that. Now, I've got to admit... Even for me, I would always have an issue of you roll those two uh, digits dice, those two 20 siders, and every single time I, get a, I roll them, I have to remember, I have to remind everybody else at the table of which color is which. Yep. Yep. I mean, I certainly. Roll, which one is which? Uh, I've played plenty of games where that was like part of the drama is that I had players who would, who would uh, call the color as they're rolling and might change right. it up from roll to roll. Blue high. <laughs> Red high, blue high, <clears throat> right? Yeah, yeah. I've definitely played so a lot. Of... Admit, even for me, the uh, the the decades die was nice to just take that off the yeah. table and not have that. And it doesn't I agree. Really, that's you know, that's just... definitely a later thing, though. I definitely remember, you know, when I was in high school playing D and D, that certainly it was always you know, we did not have the decades die, right? We had the the just just two d six and different colors, and or sorry, two d tens and different colors, and you're just going to call. What which color comes first? I don't know when the 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 modified die came up. Actually, that's an interesting interesting die. Now, also, also, I will say mechanically, as we look at the use of dice mechanically at this period, as we get into the '90s, I feel like um, so you have plenty of percentile dice games. You certainly have D and D still doing D20s, and and isn't that interesting? I don't I don't feel like that a lot of games went single D20 apart from D and D. I feel like a lot of games were trying to differentiate themselves with weird dice mechanics, or, or at least a different dice mechanic. You either had percentile, and then you had your dice pools, right? You had games like Shadowrun, yeah. Yeah, where yeah. you're just rolling a whole mess of D6s. And generally, the idea there was um, you're counting numbers of successes, right? So on any D6, a 4, 5, or 6 counts as a success, and a 1, 2, or 3 is a failure. And so you increase your odds of success by adding more dice. Do you ever play any games with dice pools, Dan? No, not a lot, frankly. Um, you know, back in the day, I was a bit of a TSR zombie. Um, uh, I feel like, you know, like dice pool, you know, the, the, the explosion of, of wanting to explore as many different kinds of mechanics as possible is a little bit of a, you know, newish thing. Um, uh, so I haven't played a lot of, of games with dice pools. Uh, you know, when I play Savage World with you, actually, is about the, the time when... Um, I guess I'm mostly thinking of the, the exploding. You have two, yeah. and then there's the exploding yeah. Dime Savage mechanic. Worlds isn't even isn't even pools, right? Savage right. Worlds is just two dice to pick the higher, um, right. which is sort of your precursor to modern advantage disadvantage mechanic. I don't think I you know it's possible I've never played a, a quote unquote dice pool game. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I certainly I played I, certainly played a chunk of uh, of Shadowrun when I was in uh, college, and that that's the game that jumps out to my head as being very dice pool. But I feel like there were a lot of other games that were dice pool oriented. Um, that that was a, that was a choice, and of course the downside, the thing that people would complain is that uh, eventually becomes uh, difficult to to. Uh, just logistically, like so the number of dice gets so big that it's annoying to handle all these dice and count up, and you're yeah. just rolling just huge fistfuls of dice. Which I don't know. As a war gamer and as a as a fireball caster, I like a big fistful of d6s. It's very satisfying to me to roll a giant fistful of d6s. Well, you know, uh, for, to, to get ready for this this yeah. show, actually, um, I was doing a little bit of research, and one of the things, and I might mention this later, um, there's a there's a, a company called uh, Games by Mail, I think, and this was about a decade ago. Uh, the gentleman made a uh, what he calls the Dice-O-Matic of this giant automated tower that just constantly rolls six sided dice over and over again uh, to use in their their online games, hmm. and apparently they roll over a million dice a day, uh, just on and on and on being read by a computer. And I believe when I was when I was review and if people haven't seen that, you should go to YouTube after this show and look up Dysomatic because it's really impressive. And when I was scanning the comments below it, one of the comments was, ah, high level shadow run. <laughs> is what it said. 
I mean, you still need to like group all the numbers together and count how many are above n, right? Um, okay, so the the I feel like uh, the ultimate sort of top tier of this where it really starts to break my brain is the ubiquity system, uh, which I remember from a game called Hollow Earth Expedition, if anyone's ever played it. Uh, now, the interesting thing is I looked this up in prep for the show, and um, uh, some of the marketing ad copy that they write about the game is number one you don't need any new dice you use whatever dice you want the theory is it's it's dice pools and it's 50 50 for any given die so use whatever die you want you want to throw a bunch of d20s or a bunch of d12s that's fine just you know if you roll the upper half that's a success and you roll the lower half that's a failure and, th and that's true i guess we could all start playing shadow run with d20s if we wanted to and count 11 plus as our successes rather than four plus as our successes right. it's a little odd and it's a right. an interesting and i feel like that is counter that the reason that they possibly are marketing that way is because then they said or you can buy our special dice so these are the special d8s they made which the whole purpose of these was to compact uh the dice pool so for example oh. <laughs> right. You can see the white ones are your are your singles, and so it's either yeah. rolling zero or one success or failure. And your reds simulate rolling. Uh, the, the distribution of numbers is supposed to simulate rolling two, right? Either you get yeah. zero successes, one successes, or two successes. Yeah. And your right. blues are supposed to simulate three dice. And and again, yeah. So now now we can you know instead of rolling nine dice, I can roll three blues. Okay, now I've come around on that. That's actually, <laughs> <laughs> actually it's, that's not bad. It's that's very bad. odd. I found very odd, and and that's you know immediately I get angry anytime any game is going to tell me you got to buy special dice. I'm like, Ugh, really special dice? I have to this day yet to ever buy any fudge dice. Do you own, do you own any fudge dice? I don't. I yeah. don't I have no. I have no I've, fudge dice. I've played a fair amount of Fate. I like the game. Right. I have avoided buying any fudge dice. Well, remind uh, me what that is. So it's, it's it's two blanks, two pluses, and two minuses. Two blanks, two pluses, two minuses. Generally, then the mechanic is you're rolling four dice, and you're going to get a range of plus four to minus four, and you're going right. to get them in a in a bell curve, and it's supposed to be that like you know that it's both simulating extreme success and extreme failure. Right. You can you can roll very poorly. That's, I think, the most interesting thing about it, right, is that you're going to generate numbers in a negative to positive range, you know, with zero being right. the, the median. Right, right. Which is interesting, I guess. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Honestly. You know, I'm still stuck on the last thing. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and, and ubiquity I'm dice. Little, <laughs> I'm a little sleep deprived. Yeah, I have never, I've never heard of those ubiquity dice, but yeah. I'm a little sleep deprived, but I can't help. But sit, like I was like a, some number of hours ago, I was reviewing uh, a, a proof of the binomial theorem that I have to go through in my discrete math class coming up this week. And it turned, the, the proof actually turned turns into a polynomial that itself turns into bit strings <laughs> and the example there are three three bit factors at a time and like i almost want to assign i almost want to assign homework now of how you would turn that into dice to produce random bit strings of size three <laughs> and for the other binomial I, I i shouldn't have said that should i i should we should We'll clip that out of post. We'll Live <laughs> show, we'll, man. Too I late. apologize, everybody. <laughs> There's my bad. You know, I I feel like I've read somewhere that 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 old school gamers uh, of some in some area had this habit of playing a silly game where somebody would just call out a range, like you know, seven to thirty-two, and then the game was how oh, quickly can yeah. you figure out how to generate that yeah. range using the existing dice? Right. Right. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. I had a, I, I did have a roommate at one point that we had a game called How Many Bits, as we would just we yeah. would announce a number, and then we had to tell how many bits you would need to store that. And then one day he just said, "You know, this is just the logarithm base two game." <laughs> uh, uh, to have that much time again, Dan, just sounds <laughs> to sit around do nothing but play stupid math games. So. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Uh, let's 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 talk. Let's talk about. Uh, I want to. I want to keep pushing forward. Um, Please do. I want to talk about uh, Luzaki. 
Uh, yes. And there, there, are two, there are two angles on this. One, I think, came up earlier in the chat, and I'm just going to put uh, two dice here up on the, on the screen. Um, that is uh, sort of your standard white D20 that you're going to get at any game shop. And then the purple one is actually a game science die, um, which was the dice that, that Luzaki was always hawking at conventions. Um, right. And 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 the the thing that that really draws out about it being uh, one of his dice is the sharp edges, and he was uh, very uh, insistent about how that was the proper way. That most dice, I guess, in order to um, produce the 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 shape that they have and the and the ink, it's really about the inking, right? That they would like dip the the die into paint, which fills all the right. numbers, but also coats the whole thing in right. in ink or paint. Right. And then they would put the thing in a rock tumbler to get all the extra paint off the edges. And that also right. is what produces the rounded corners we see on dice these days. Right. Yeah. And his argument is that that also deforms the dice and makes them no longer purely uh, equally random. Correct. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, like, a, you know, a lot of dice that would come with, you know, a game like Monopoly or something like that, right? Like, here's here's a couple. Mm -hmm. They're a little rounded, right? They're a yeah. little they're a little rounded on the edges. And my, you know, I don't, I actually haven't ever gamed in Vegas. But you know, my understanding is that, and so, but but I have gotten dice uh, from a Vegas casino, yeah. And they are uh, like you're saying for the Zaki guys, they are very sharp corners. Like they're they're like actually dangerously sharp. And I don't actually use these in games a lot because they can actually hurt you. And my understanding is that they do have uh, legal requirements. Is that they have inspectors come around once in a while, grab the dice, line them up like this, and see how how flush. They can get the edges to be permissible yeah. dice. So yeah. my understanding is that's actually a legal requirement for six siders in Vegas. I, th um, I thought I had read somewhere that Vegas D sixes are not even cast; that they're like machined or something to get that mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, would, I would believe. That. Uh, and, yeah. they, and the pips aren't div divots either. They're 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 flat painted they're on. Flat they're not. Painted. They're not. Uh, divots inside, and the, you know the funny thing is, I have a I have a funny historical experience with Zaki dice because at some point, when I was young, I got one of those dice and it was very sharp. And for many years, I read it as being unfinished, like it looked like yeah. an an unfinished amateurish die to me. And I was like, uh, you know, this is, I, it was actually kind of secondary for me. And it was many years later that I learned that was intentional to keep the um, the the results fair. And I actually did a statistical test on it compared to my other dice, and it absolutely was borne out. Yeah. Uh, Lutaki is completely correct. It, it has much more balanced and fair results than he, the machine dipped and tumbled dice. He's totally right about that. When, when he used to keep a booth at Gen Con, he would regularly have this uh, delightful uh, rant that he would, uh, or, or, or his method of hawking his dice, I suppose. Um, and I remember hearing him deliver this, some of this live, but you can find it on YouTube now if you just search for Luzaki uh, and Dice. And it's like, it's like a three-part YouTube video of him giving his whole rant about the modern, you know, modern, which is probably 90s at this, this point when he was doing this, uh, method of creating Dice and why it was inferior to his method of creating Dice. Which I think is really I think, interesting. I think William in the chat is remembering part of that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I think William has a quote there. It says, "Rounded edges will kill your characters." And I think I remember Lou saying, "Can you just, um, think of how many player characters have been killed over the years yeah. by unfair dice?" It's great. It's it's great. It's a, it's a it's a lovely bit of salesmanship. Yeah, I mean, you got to listen to him deliver it because it's just so right. nice. And he had all yeah. kinds of really interesting proofs. Like he would do things like stack the d20s on top mm -hmm. of each other, and you yeah. can see that they were different heights because they were yeah. not perfectly round. They were oblong, yeah. depending on what order you stacked them in. Anyway. Uh, it's it's delightful. I recommend it. Does it actually matter? Do we actually care for the purposes generally of role playing games? You know, okay. So for me personally, yeah. obviously yes. Like obviously, <laughs> painfully, absolutely, a hundred percent yes. Now I I learn over time that not everybody thinks like me. An another shocking <laughs> news flash on today's wandering DMs. Not everybody thinks like me, and and some people are not that. Um, uh, uh, upset about slightly unbalanced dice, but uh, for me, I kind of do. I kind of do want that to be the case, frankly. The the 
interesting thing is the other thing that Zaki is kind of famous for now, besides this delightful rant and the game science dice, which are all like uh, clearly of a much higher standard and are going to give you better, uh, better random distribution of numbers. Uh, uh, he's also kind of famous for this set of dice, which are sometimes just referred to as Zaki dice now, right? And they're classically, yeah, well, you can't win them all, can classically you? used by um, uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics, right? Uses these yeah. dice. Uh, and here you see you have a D3, a D5, a D7, a D14, a D16, a D24, and a D30. And, and now Dan will proceed to have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> They're just okay. I mean, the D three platonic song. That's just a renumbered platonic song. That's fine. But oh my God, those are ugly. The interesting thing is, like, there's there's different variants of these. Uh, I have a set yeah. here on me that I bought, and you can see that my while well, my D twenty four is this interesting, unusual right. shape. Um, my right. D sixteen and my D five and my D seven are just variants of the D ten. Right? They're that same oh, general okay. shape. And my yeah. D3 is just a D6 numbered one through three right. twice. Right, 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 right. Uh, so there's definitely yeah, there's different some, ways these have been produced. I almost wish that 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 overall model that they're using for D10 type things, there's some you know mathematical term for that kind of thing that I wish I, I had to took my tongue right now. Um, okay, those aren't quite as ugly, but still. Um, Jason, so you could just use solids. Hmm? You could just use platonic solids and, and just not 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 just don't have those things. Just, just don't, don't have, have them. a seven. Jeez, I, they're kind of funny, right? I don't. I'm not totally sure why TCC uses them. I guess they're trying to fill out the the steps, the gradations of random number generation, right? Um, so another game that where this comes up uh, for me is actually Demon Wars, uh, the game produced by um, uh, Ari Salvatore and, and his sons, uh, based on his novels. Um, Interestingly, in that game, the damage, um, a lot of times you have effects that, that increase or decrease the step of your damage die. So maybe you're doing a mm -hmm. D6 and you right. have some effect that gives you plus one step to your damage die, so mm -hmm. you go from a D6 to a D8. And then right. they fill in the gaps with multiple dice, so, so you go from D12, I think, to 2D8 is the next step after D12. Right, where they're trying to fill in some of those gaps, but you're changing the distribution by because you're immediately once you add in a second die, you're going into a bell shape rather than a linear progression. So I could see, well, instead, why not get out your your D14 and your D16? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's why they do that. Yeah, they do that. yeah. Yeah, um, and I think you know D, uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics does similar things with I think the um, oh I guess like fighters get multiple attacks right, but if you if you decide to do two attacks instead of rolling a d twenty, you're gonna roll two uh, d sixteen. This is specifically right? a, an ability of the halfling in Dungeon Crawl Classics. Halfling has the ability yeah. to make multiple attacks using two d sixteen instead of two d twenty. Okay, all right. All right, thank you for remembering that. Wow, crazy. Um, it's an oddity that's in my head for some reason. <laughs> right, 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 right. And obviously, you know, jumping all the way down to D12 would be a little bit over, would be would be punishing. Here's, a, here's an uh, interesting um, point from one of our viewers. Uh, Manahan says, I think DCC is trying to evoke the feeling of weirdness and novelty the polyhedral dice originally evoked for us decades ago. Right? That's that's cer an, that's certainly... That's that's yeah, that's a great argument, right? Because certainly yeah. that's that is DCC all over it, right? DCC is definitely trying to feel weird and unusual and strange and yeah, <clears throat> I could see that. There's nothing weirder to my eye than that D7. Uh, this particular D7 is such an yeah. odd duck because it lands point up and then they've etched the numbers yeah. across multiple edges and it's just right. God, that thing is weird. Yeah, in our in, in 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 our games, I have an inside joke where I literally start barking where um where anybody brings up that D seven, frankly. So and there are four people bring it out pretty commonly in order to get me to start barking. Just 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 to, just to irritate you. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Uh, so you know here, someone's gonna, someday someone's going to make like a game that has a mechanic where you play a cleric and you only roll d sevens, and that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's when Dan loses his mind. Um, another game that I played once, exactly once, uh, that irritated the crap out of me with its dice was actually uh, Warhammer Fantasy 3rd Edition. 
if you ever played Warhammer okay. Fantasy 3rd Edition, it used these dice. Yeah, that's... It looks like D6s. D6s, D10s, and D8s, but they have weird symbols on them and different numbers of the symbols, and it's all very odd. Um, And I'm trying to remember how they got used, and it's I'm I'm struggling, struggling to come up. But the one thing I remember for sure was that when you were rolling skill checks, you rolled both one type of die that determined whether you were successful or not, but there was a second die that got thrown into the mix, which informed whether you performed the skill... Uh, in a good way or a bad way. So it, it converted your results into a two-axis. You could fail in a good way, or you could succeed in a bad way. And it was up to the DM to then add interpretation as to what the hell that means. Give me, can you give me an example of like succeeding in a bad way? What is, what is that sure. Mean? Okay, so let's say I'm jumping off of the uh, balcony and I'm going to tackle the bad guy, right? And I roll succeed in a good way. So I jump down and I tackle him to the ground and I've got him pinned on the ground. Great. You know, woohoo. Uh, succeed in a bad way. I jump to the ground. I crash into him. We both go tumbling onto the ground. I twist my ankle and we're both lying on the ground. Okay. All right. Right? Yeah. yeah All right. I did what I was trying to do. I knocked him down, but in a not a good way. Okay. I get it. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, you know, likewise, I guess like six, uh, fail in a good way is I totally miss him and I and I and I somersault and I roll and I land in a nice three point turn and I, and I look graceful and intentional even though I ultimately did not do what I was trying to do. Interesting, yeah. interesting. You know, having having seen the, the the ubiquity dice and the fudge dice and these dice and uh, other things for for uh, you know Warhammer system like that, one question comes up is. So obviously these are the same platonic shapes. It's just that they have different symbols written on them. Is is that really super valuable? And you know, I got to admit, like a lot of other people, I have in the past been intrigued or maybe excited by the artistry or something like that. And I've certainly got you know like customized weather dice <laughs> and uh, the the D twelve for hit location dice um, and a bunch of other stuff. Like I have a set here that you can. Uh, roll a whole random dungeon of like the direction these the, the quarter go in, and partly because my use case became to run games on the road. Like I was usually not playing. I was I was often DMing, but not in my house. So I had to have a pack uh, here in New York, and I'd take public transit. I'd take the subway to go to a friend's house, and so partly for me, my use case was I needed minimalized packing i needed like small rule book small amount of stuff not carrying miniatures and, a, and even a small box of dice is i got to a point whereby i kind of really couldn't support i couldn't really um defend having a whole bunch of exotic printed dice that i didn't use a whole lot yeah. and so i got to a point i was like if it's just a d6 why not just use a table or just remember what the results are and i discarded a lot of that stuff and just said, it's a D6, and I'll just remember what the results are instead of getting customized dice for it. How do you Certain, feel about that? Um, yeah, I, I, I basically agree with that, right? Like, I feel like the classic use case of these sort of custom dice is if we go back and you look at, say, a game like um, uh, <coughs> Hero Quest. Okay, Hero mm-hmm. Quest mm-hmm. is your sort of bring RPGs to the masses. You know, it's light, mm-hmm. it's board gamey. A lot of people remember it really fondly. I freaking love that game. Came with a bunch of custom D6s with weird symbols on them. Now, the symbols mm-hmm. ultimately just boiled down to a 1 and 3, 2 and 3, and 3 and 3 chance, right? Mm-hmm. And that's all they were doing, right? But they right. were just, yeah, I, I feel like they were just trying to make it more mainstream, right? Sort of help people who didn't want to do the math part. Right? Oh, I see the skull, or I see the happy face, or the axe, or whatever. I know what that means, and I don't have to think about probability and numbers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That said, uh, most gamers I talk to like to think about things like math and probability and numbers. So, you know, I don't want you to take that away. I like that, right? There's there's an argument that, in fact, uh, the act of role-playing actually hones your math skills. Right? This is good for kids to help them improve their math skills. You know, someday some of them might even get like a job as like a math professor. <laughs> as a that, that kind of, who knows? Stranger things can happen. Why that comes to mind. Yeah. 
Uh, one thing that's really annoys me these days is there's this uh, trend now to put a custom uh, icon either right. you know on a normal die. So you have here a D6 that right, where right. they've replaced the one pip, or sometimes you'll see a D20 where they replace the 20 pip. Or right. the worst case scenario for me is they pick a D20 where they replace both the 20 and the one with custom things. Ooh, no. And I despise it chiefly because it's totally inconsistent, right? So you pull out a bunch of dice, yeah. you throw them, the weird right. symbol comes up, and then you have to go, right. wait, is that the one or the six? Is that the one or the 20? I don't remember. Right. Which one did this company I, replace? I have a couple um, sixers here, and they wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't be um, legal for, for uh, actual gambling, but I have a couple uh, dice that have like promotional text, uh, mm -hmm. Las Vegas text around the one pip. So the one pip's still there. I, I, I don't know if th this kind of promotion came first and then it bled into the role playing Interesting. industry. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, I don't that know. I, that you could buy with a little bit more. Have you seen, you know, one thing like one or two years ago, boy, I came really close to purchasing it was the, uh, the electronic D20 that actually lights up and starts flashing if it lands on the 20 side. I don't have, uh, yeah, I've seen that, and I remember people playing with it. Yeah. Um, you know, right. BJ used to have one of those, and I think he used to use that in right. our game. That's it, right, yeah. right. I came really close to getting one of those. When it comes um, to novelty, ridiculous novelty dice, one thing that I remember, you may remember me playing with back in the day, um, are, 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 are these suckers, which is totally a D6 inside another D6, <laughs> right? That is... Uh, this. And, and I, it amused the crap out of me to use these for things like uh, fireballs, where I'd roll four of them, but I'm really rolling 8d6. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, eh, it's a silly novelty, though, really, ultimately. <laughs> now, I, I, uh, you know, on the one hand, there are, sometimes I'm attracted to that kind of thing, and then my mind immediately goes, that's not, that's clearly not going to be balanced or fair. And I see in the chat that uh, William is, is confirming my concern about the light up D20 that uh, he's, he's saying it rolled terribly. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, probably. We're confirming that. Like, obviously, that had to be the case. Um, yeah, when you throw a fireball in our D and D games and you yank out our D, your your D sixes and D sixes, I didn't mind that. That was kind of cool. <laughs> I, they make a very satisfying noise. Is what mostly yeah, I like about them. They made a really good kind of clittery clattery noise when I rolled them, which was amusing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, you know, so. The interesting thing is now, these days, whether it's just because of the way technology is going or possibly because pandemic, um, now we're seeing more and more stuff happening in the digital realm, right? We're seeing, you know, you go to D&D Beyond and now I can roll right. digital 3D dice and uh, right. D20 Pro has it. Um, right. uh, one thing I have here is, let's see if I can pull this up. Uh, this is a screenshot of a new feature in Vorpal Board called the Dice Builder which will actually let you upload images to create your own custom dice for use in their in their virtual tabletop. So if you're using okay. Vorpal Board, you can now uh, make, uh, I don't know if you can see this very well, but I've basically made a D6 that is black and all the faces are blank except one which has a cat on it. <laughs> because I could. <laughs> one in six cats. Great. There you go. There you go. Um... Yeah, so that's becoming a thing, and and crazily enough, like I, I'm pretty sure that uh, D and D Beyond is now like selling fancy custom dice. You can buy oh, no. sets of you know dice, oh, no. and, and they'll do things like talking about your light up D twenty. Oh, they'll no. do things like they'll fill the screen with crackling energy or something when you roll D when you roll a twenty, and they'll they'll have a nice effect and a little maybe sound effect. Uh, <laughs> You know, Paul, this is a little bit inside baseball, but obviously when you and I met, we were at a company that in the 90s that was that was trying to go in the direction of virtual property before <laughs> that was a thing. And um, we were that we were so far ahead. Of, <laughs> we were so far ahead of our time um, uh, at that company. Um, and I did not I would not have guessed that those things would have taken off as much as they have as far as downloadable content or yep. you know purchasable skin purchasable skins or things like that and I, my, my mind just never goes there so now that you yep. told me that of course they're selling customized digital dice i'm like yep. Yep. of course, of they, course are. they are and of course I, they are. my wildest nightmares i never would have come up with that myself yeah yeah i don't know if it would be as big as it is it is if it weren't for covid right like the fact yep. is everybody's playing at their computers now so right I, personally, I'd still rather have physical dice in my hand. 
um, you know, to we the point to the point of, of having built this preposterous, you know, uh, <laughs> dice cam thing so that I can there use this in my in my game so I can roll physical dice and people can still see what dice I'm rolling. Uh, by the way, we have a YouTube video up on our channel of how you can build one of these if you're interested. <laughs> You should totally watch it. Actually, kind of delightful uh, do-it-yourself construction project. Yeah. Um, and you know, you start there, and ten thousand steps later, you're at the Dysomatic. <laughs> For sure. For sure. I have one. Other, before we run out of time, I have one other weird set of dice that I purchased that I wanted to share here. Um, this is actually the first Kickstarter I ever backed. So this has got to be at least ten years old at this point. But I bought uh, Dungeon Morph dice. Yeah. Which are literally very large D20s um, that have uh, geomorphs. I'm uh, sorry, D6s, not D20s. D6s that have uh, geomorphs printed on them. And I love nice. the idea of this. I love the idea of, like, one of these days I thought I'm going to sit down to a game uh, with no prep and I'm just going to roll these dice and just let them go and line them up and run a game. Uh, it's never happened. <laughs> <laughs> never, yeah, you know, so again, that's the kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's the kind of thing that I've I've kind of stumbled into with you know customized dice of like get them and then not wind up not actually using them. Yeah. Now I've seen uh, you know Map Master Dyson logos uh, make um, geomorph dice a couple times. Are these are these maps by him or or someone else? I don't believe so. These were done yeah. by I think a group called Inkwell Designs. I think was the name of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, familiar, it's possible that he's. I mean, again, this is this was actually quite some time ago that I backed these. This is again the first time I ever um, ever backed a Kickstarter, which is I think has got to be at least uh, close to ten years ago that that I did this. So uh, possibly they've he's done something in collaboration with Dyson since then. I, or I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, John Miller in chat is reaffirming there by Inkwell Designs, which yep, yep. And big plans for these things never, never came to fruition, unfortunately. Understood. Understood. Um, you know, again, there was a there was a for for the uh, outdoor spoliation games that I run. Um, I came up with a D six mechanic for random dungeons, and at, and at one point, I was like, I'm going to have to have a, a, a um, customized die for it. And it's like, well, I'll just remember. I'll just remind my. I'll just remember what the one through six is. And actually, I just use the pips as just sort of like reminder thing. So a one's a narrow tunnel and a six six is a big cavern and things like that. So you know, I, tend of, to, nowadays, I tend to go in that direction. A lot of folks uh, talk about using um, standard D6s for fudge dice that you can interpret mm -hmm. the pips as pluses and minuses or zeros. That the four and six are like a zero uh, and that the, yeah. what is it, the, the, the five and something else are like a plus three, three maybe? Yeah, I don't know. And I, I, I'm sure that I've seen people with like standard pipped white D6s that they've then taken a Sharpie to to convert into into gotcha, plus, gotcha. minus, and zero. Yeah, gotcha. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, the, it's the, like, the I one is the I have a number of dice that have multiple symbols on a side, right? So I have, um, I have uh, this, this, I can't remember what set this comes from, but uh, a, a D6 that has normal numbers plus. Yeah. Uh, hit locations on it. I actually, this this actually is probably the single customized die that I really actually do use on a regular basis. It's just for descriptive purposes of hits in D and D. I actually roll this usually before an attack is made, and then use the uh, the limb that pops up as a descriptor. Uh, you know, it doesn't really change the mechanics usually. Um, that actually is the one single customized die. So if it if it's double usage like that of possibly two things, then for me that becomes more valuable. We were talking about earlier, um, you had, um, just really quickly, uh, we being reminded in the chat that it's Inkwell Ideas, not Inkwell Designs, that made yes. the, um, yes. that made the, <clears throat> the uh, Geomorph or Dungeon Morph dice, uh, which also interestingly did not also have the numbers one through six on each side. So you could do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Good. yeah. I just want to bring up, you, you showed earlier you have some of these on hand, this, this um, you know, D12s that had location, hit locations. Um, yeah. to, to date, my favorite hit location, though, uh, mechanic is ultimately what Warhammer Fantasy 1st and 2nd Edition did, which is uh, you were rolling percentile dice to hit, and then they had a chart, a uh, table for hit location where you were supposed to take the to hit roll and reverse the digits 
and use that as a lookup. And I always thought that was extremely elegant. It's nice. You're not rolling another thing. It's the same. You know, you rolled that to hit. It also told you the hit location. Uh, most of the character sheets had that little chart on them somewhere, so you could quickly look and see what the hit location was. And um, it was just this very elegant bit of design because it also ensured a nice even distribution of hit locations. For example, head was hit location 00 through 05, which if you weren't reversing your digits would mean that the lower percentage chance you had to hit, the more likely you are to hit in the head. But since you're reversing them, they're now nicely distributed across the, the, the hit you know, hit rolls. They're actually happening at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 on the dice. That is that that is pretty clever. You told me about that shortly before we started the show today. Um, I think that's pretty clever. Um, and oh, interesting. So and so, John, in the chat is saying that Top Secret Second Edition they did the same thing. Interesting. Worse than I, I did not know that. It's really nice. Uh, and it, it's and remember in second edition Warhammer Fantasy, you had the, the standard character sheet had this section because also armor was based on body location. So you would have X number of armor points on either your right. head or your arms or your torso. Yeah. So they had this lovely little picture on the character sheet of, of a person. And then next to each hit location, it had the numbers as well as a blank spot to enter how many armor points you had there. And so it was just this very nice, uh, nice. you know, visualization of all those mechanics in one little picture. I think there was an add-on to, I think there was a, a, a supplement to the uh, TSR Star Frontiers sci-fi game, which, you know, normally used percentiles, whereby it had critical hits that were triggered if you got uh, double digits, right? So yep. if you got 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, uh, that would be a critical hit. And I always thought that was similarly kind of elegant because then that would constitute about 10% of whatever your two-hit range was. And yeah. it wasn't um, it wasn't biased to having either you know high or low chances to hit. It was always about ten percent, no matter what. It's kind of interesting that you can kind of get away with that. With per apparently, you can get away with that kind of add-on mechanic with percentiles, but not with other dice. So I guess having two dice in the mix allows you to have sort of a second mechanic. It's interesting, right? Because percentiles are your one case where you're rolling multiple dice, but you have, but you're still in a linear progression. Um, and yeah, it's certainly this is the one really normal interesting. Case, right? The D sixty six does the same thing technically. Yeah, D sixty six is a really weird. I I know I've seen that used in some places, but it always it, it there's something mind breaking about that because you think that it generates sixty six unique values, which is not true, right? It, generates what is it 36 unique values right. <laughs> so right. there's something weird about that it's uh it's uh you have to um yeah it's different it's, you know, it's <laughs> nice to have to it, right again that that was you know that was created at, at a point before the actual d10 percentile dice. it's certainly much nicer to have the percentiles absolutely yeah. yeah yeah and you have to remember that you know what is now you're in you know because now you're working in base six Except it's yeah. not it's not zero through five either. It's one through six. So what if you have sixteen and you add one? What do you have after that? Oh jeez, well, twenty one. Twenty one. Twenty one. Right. 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 There's yeah. no zero. Yeah. Ah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Honestly, that's. I feel like that's why you see all these systems that are either d twenty based or percentile based uh, most commonly is because it's so easy for us to reason about the probability values, right? Like, yes. Yeah. Ultimately, d20 is just an extrapolation of percent, right? We can we can right. say every every point is actually worth five percent, and that's very easy to translate that. Um, well, it's interesting to bring that up, Paul, because all of my notes uh, today were about that because yeah. I kind of was actually. I apologize. I was confused. I didn't know we were actually going to talk about different types of dice. I thought we were going to talk about that to, to, instead. So I will just put that over here for another day. For, for episode two of Dice. Yeah. Dice Mechanics. Right. We'll have to get into yeah. Dice Mechanics. Great. Great. Yes. Yeah, I thought we were going to yeah. get into Dice Mechanics too, but obviously we filmed the whole hour just talking about all the ridiculous shapes of plastic we have. Um, of course we did. <laughs> of course we did. Yeah. All right. Of course all right. we did that. All right. Yes. Well, we'll do, we, we'll didn't do... even, we didn't even pull out an actual Zaki D100 um we didn't you know we don't we don't have you know gemstone dice that people produce 
Um, we didn't get into uh, heavy-duty probability talk. I, I will I will point out that in season one of Wandering DMs, there was an episode where I did a basic dice probability uh, chat for an hour on my own. So if you're interested in, in basic dice probability, please go look at that. Uh, that might be an interesting adjunct to this particular episode as well. Well, let me let me before we close out, Dan. Let me ask you this: What do you think about metal dice? They're heavy. <laughs> <laughs> They're heavy. They're very heavy. I feel like They're I inevitably end up at a table with yeah. someone who uses metal dice, and there's yeah. somebody who's just always really into that. And I always think, great. Now you need yeah. a pad to roll it on so you don't damage the table. You know, yes. they just, you know, they're loud as heck. Um, uh, I mean, they're beautiful. But, I mean, we got, we, you know, you and I, I think we've gotten gifted with metal dice from super, super, you know, generous colleagues of ours, maybe a couple times. And they're so, they're so beautiful. And uh, I am constantly worried that I'm going to break the table. Uh, <laughs> throw them on. I mean, I already have, you know, I get overexcited and I, I'm commonly, you know, throwing yeah. dice off tables and off walls and stuff like that. And I'm worried that I'm, I actually am kind of worried that I'm going to hurt somebody, frankly. I'm pretty prone to doing that. So I, even though I have metal dice, I personally avoid using them out of awareness of my propensity to injure people. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm fairly pragmatic about my need for dice to be random number generators. And I feel like anything that gets in the way of that starts to irritate yeah. me. Uh, dice that are overly ornate to the point where I can't read yeah. the digit anymore. No, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not only not only just me, but I want the whole table to be able to see the number. I want, you know, I, the last thing I want is to roll the d20, it rolls out, and everybody looks at it and goes, what does that say? Oh, come right. on, you're, you're, you're spoiling the drama. Well put. Super <laughs> yeah. well put. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree with that. Uh, and that's another reason why, the, right, the d6s, like they use in the casino games, they're very visible, right, with the pips. They're very visible. You can Isn't see it's it fascinating from that that's still the only die type that really comes in pips. Why do none of the other dice have pips? Well, there is the uh, there's the, there's the the, the, the classic uh, magical number seven, right? So most people's ability to visually chunk data taps out like around seven. So even right. as soon as you get to D eight, uh, a lot of people would have difficulty telling the difference between a six or a seven or eight. Uh, would be my initial stab at that. So can, can they make a D four with pips? I'm wondering what that would look like. Well, D4s are already, they're already trouble for everybody. They're, they're <laughs> hard to, right? Do you, put the num do you put the number at the bottom at the base or do you at the top at the peak and did you step on it while you were cleaning your kid's room and injure yourself <laughs> that way? So yeah. D4s already have enough issues already that I don't think, yeah. I don't think anybody wants to do that. Right. Uh, right. D6s are, right, if, particularly if you're used doing war gaming like I do with Book of War, you have a whole lot of D6s around. Uh, it makes sense to, you know, it, it can make sense for a lot of mechanics to be based on the D6. Um, uh, like in board games still. It's, a reasonable, it's yeah. a reasonable thing to do. All right, Dan, we are about out of time. Any, any final thoughts on dice? I have many, but I, just, yeah. I think I would just start. I just start rambling on a whole different, whole, whole different subject. Okay. Great. Uh, you know, really fascinating where we have come from. Uh, it's really. I got to admit, the D twenty is super nice. Um, uh, it's, there are times when, with D and D, I do wish there was just a D six D twenty game. There, are, there's a little part of my soul that is that would be really minimalist and really nice. When I'm personally running D and D. As the DM, I mostly just have D20s and D6s. Hmm. The players have the other types of polyhedral dice. And that works pretty well for us. Interesting. Yeah. Great. Uh, do you think that we should run a second part, a part two of dice, for specifically for the variety of dice mechanics? Do we have another hour well, maybe in we should ask our viewers about that. Excellent. That, that is I, a great I idea. I think we're always... Like I, I like I like all this stuff. So if our if our yeah. viewers tell us that we should do a, 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 a dice mechanic, like how do you use the dice more? Then yeah. I would be all for that. Great. If you have an opinion on more issues that you'd like to hear us discuss regarding dice, or specifically dice mechanics, how dice get used, have examples that we haven't thought of, maybe, and you want to toss those into the comments to fuel uh, part two of this uh, topic, please uh, leave them in the comments. We'd really love to hear from you. We definitely do. 
And if you're new to the show, of course, remember that you can like, follow, and subscribe to us on a variety of social media, like on YouTube and Twitch, as well as Twitter and Facebook. And we do have the handle Wandering DMs on all of those sites. Likewise, if you prefer, you can listen to our shows in audio-only podcast format. Those are available on our website at wanderingdms.com and through various podcast carriers such as Google Podcast and iTunes and Spotify. If you're listening to us from one of those carriers, uh, please take a moment to rate and review us there. That helps other folks find our show. It really does. And, of course, thanks to our growing list of patrons who support the Wandering DM show here. We could not do what we're doing without your generous support. And if you would like to join our patrons in supporting Wandering DMs and our various shows, uh, please do visit patreon.com slash wandering DMs, and you'll see our different tier levels, access to a Discord server where we actually do an additional uh, chat after each of our shows, particularly Sunday that we'll do in a couple minutes here. Uh, other benefits you'll see there on patreon.com. And um, don't forget our other shows. I think we're going to have... We, we have one more episode of The Big Bad coming on Tuesday. Is that right, Paul? We do. The, the, uh, the award ceremony. Where we're going to have representatives from every team come back and rejoin us. We're going to declare the winner. Uh, we're going to talk about all the awesome things they did in the game, have them compare notes and uh, you know, uh, share stories and share memories of uh, what they loved and uh, what drove them crazy about their episodes. <laughs> In, in some ways, the, the award ceremony was actually my favorite uh, episode to actually shoot, as a matter of fact. It was a little bit less, less tense for me. So personally, I thought it was like a really fun uh, uh, overview chat of what had happened. Now, if viewers have watched every single episode of The Big Bad in Season 1, you know who won the season, but the players don't. Yep. So in the award ceremony this Tuesday, you're going to see the players themselves actually find out for the first time um, who actually uh, is the champion of the season. And if you happen to miss an episode, uh, you can find out yourself uh, Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time this evening. Yeah, definitely definitely recommend checking it out. It's a lot of fun to see some of them. Uh, some of those groups discover things about the game that they had no idea existed um, and to share share their stories with each other is, uh, is a really good time. It's kind of interesting because at this point, the viewers of the Big Bad, in some sense, know a, a quite a bit more about the show than the players actually than the, than did. Than the players will. Yep. Yep. So you, yep. can actually, you can actually watch that and kind of, in your mind, lord over how much more you know <laughs> about the secrets of the Big Bad than the actual players do. So that's the yeah. last, final episode of Season 1 for the Big Bad this Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, are you, do you have a uh, 10 Dead Rats on Thursday, Paul, this week? Uh, we do. We do. We will be back after our brief hiatus from Thanksgiving. Uh, so we'll be back this Thursday. Fantastic. So we'll all be looking forward to that Thursday from 8 to 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And, of course, we are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for conversations like you, you are experiencing right this very second and things like this. So we do hope that you'll join us again next week for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.